With Chapter 10, we start to bring together all the topics we've covered so far as we head toward the end game in this course, Capital Budgeting Decision Making. We were very briefly introduced to the weighted average cost of capital in the last chapter. In Chapter 10, we covered how to find the weighted average cost of capital. What are the costs of capital included? How to find the component cost? And how to adjust for risk? First, some definitions. The cost of capital to a firm is the return demanded by investors. The return on assets depends on the risk of those assets and how the market views that risk. Put simply, a firm must earn at least the cost of money on any investment it pursues. You wouldn't borrow money at 10% to invest in a project projected to return 8%. A firm acquires capital from a variety of sources. Debt can come from short-term notes payable or long-term debt. We would only consider notes payable as a source of capital if a firm uses it continuously as a source of financing. We won't be including it in our study. Preferred stock is clearly a source of capital. Common equity capital can come from two sources, retained earnings and newly issued common stock. Capital comes from preferred stock, common stock, and debt. Accounts payable, accruals, and other sources of cash are not from investors. This is the weighted average cost of capital formula. The W factors are the weights, the percentage of each component that make up the funding of the firm. The R components are the cost of each type of capital, the cost of debt, the cost of preferred, etc. And T is the firm's corporate tax rate. In this chapter, we'll look at how we arrive at each variable in this equation. Before we go further, two major points. Finance is concerned with after-tax cost. Only the cost of debt is adjusted for tax effects since interest on debt is tax deductible. The weighted average cost of capital is typically used to evaluate investment opportunities to be undertaken in the future. We aren't usually interested in what the cost of capital was last year. We need to know the cost of the next dollar of capital, the marginal cost of money to the firm. The weights used in the weighted average cost of capital formula represent the percentage of the firm funded by each source of capital. The optimal source for weights is the firm's own target capital structure. As an insider, you may have access to this data. As an outsider, you may not. The next best choice is to use market value weights. The market value of equity is simply the number of shares outstanding times the price per share. Market value of debt, number of bonds outstanding times the current selling price per bond. Using book value is a last resort since book value may not correctly reflect market values. Let's work through an example to see how this works. Coleman Technologies has a 25% tax rate. They have bonds outstanding with a 12% coupon paid semi-annually and 15 years to maturity. The bonds currently sell for $1153.72. Ignore any flotation costs for new bonds. Coleman has preferred stock with a 10% annual coupon currently selling for $111.10. Note that the $100 par value of the preferred stock is irrelevant in our calculation. Coleman's common stock is selling for $50 a share. The last dividend was $4.19, and Coleman expects this dividend to grow at a constant 5% forever. Coleman's stock has a beta of 1.2. The current yield on Treasury bonds is 7%, and the market risk premium is estimated to be 6%. A bond yield risk premium is estimated at 4%, and we'll talk about where this fits as we move through the example. Coleman's target capital structure is 30% debt, 10% preferred, 60% common equity. Beginning with the debt component, we already know the weight of debt, 30%. The cost of debt we need is the marginal cost, the cost of what the next dollar of debt raised would cost. That equals the yield to maturity on Coleman's current debt. And don't forget, interest on debt is tax deductible, so we adjust the cost of debt accordingly. For the maturity of 15 years in semi-annual coupon, N is equal to 30. The coupon of 12% annually equals $120 divided by 2, so payment is 60. Current price is entered as a negative present value. Future value is 1,000. Solve for IY, 5%, but this is a semi-annual bond, so we need to double the resulting IY to find the annual yield to maturity of 10%. To compare the cost of debt with the cost of other capital components, we need to view the after-tax cost, 7.5%. Moving across the equation, our next component is the cost of preferred. Again, we need a marginal cost, the cost to Coleman if they issued preferred stock now. 
Preferred dividends are not tax deductible, so there's no tax adjustment, and we'll ignore flotation costs at this point. Recall that the formula for the cost of preferred is merely the basic constant growth model with g equals zero. Also, note that the equation uses the current price, not the par value. Since most common stock doesn't have a par value, this doesn't come up with common, but preferred frequently does. The cost of preferred, $10 divided by 111.10, 9%. Preferred stock is riskier than debt. Remember the bankruptcy priority list? The order is debt, preferred, and at the bottom, common stock. So preferred is riskier than debt, but less risky than common stock. A firm can skip a preferred dividend, but they try not to, because if they do skip it, they're precluded from paying any common dividends until the preferred ones are caught up. And it's a signal that the firm doesn't have the cash needed to pay the dividends. To compare the cost correctly, we should compare the after-tax cost. And the after-tax cost of preferred, 9%, is higher than the after-tax cost of debt, 7.5% consistent with the riskier nature of preferred. And the last component cost of capital, equity. Equity can come from two sources. RS is the cost of retained earnings. RE is the cost of new equity. Recall that retained earnings belong to the shareholders. They just weren't paid out as dividends, but retained to reinvest in the firm. Retained earnings have an opportunity cost. If it had been paid out, shareholders could have earned a return on it. The firm could have repurchased its own stock and earned RS. So retained earnings are not free money. Easy, but not free. We have three methods to find an estimate of the cost of retained earnings. CAPM from Chapter 8, Discounted Cash Flow Model from Chapter 9, and Own Bond Yield Plus Risk Premium, a new benchmark method. To find the cost of equity using CAPM, we need to find a proxy for the risk-free rate, typically the long bond, the 30-year treasury. Estimate the market risk premium or determine a proxy for the return on the market, typically the return on the S&P 500. Find or calculate beta. Substitute these into the CAPM SML equation. For Coleman, the data was given. 7% risk free rate, market risk premium of 6%, beta 1.2. We find a cost of equity, 14.2. The CAPM approach does have advantages. It specifically adjusts for risk and it can be used for any company that has a beta. On the downside, virtually all of the CAPM components are estimates or proxies, and we're using historical data to estimate a future cost. To use the discounted cash flow constant growth model, we need three pieces of data. The current stock price, that's observable. The current or last dividend paid, that's published history. The constant growth rate, we need an estimate of that. The growth rate is the one variable that we cannot observe. We have two choices as sources. We could use historical data to estimate a growth rate, assuming the future will be like the past. Or we could use analyst estimates. Many publish forecasts, but analysts typically estimate earnings growth, not dividends growth. Using our given data, D0, 419. Current price, $50, growth rate 5%. Substituting in, we find the cost of equity, 13.8. The advantage of the DCF approach is its simplicity. It's easy to use, easy to understand. But it only applies to companies that are paying dividends. We must be able to reasonably assume the growth rate is constant. It does not consider risk. It is very sensitive to the growth rate. Our third technique is a new one, own bond yield plus risk premium. This is not the same risk premium as used in CAPM. Ibbotson and Associates compiles data on average returns for a variety of asset classes over time periods since 1926. AAA rated bonds, AA rated bonds, large cap stock, T bonds, etc. Assuming Coleman is a large cap firm and their bonds are AAA rated, the 4% is the difference between the average returns on those two asset classes. This gives a ballpark estimate, really useful for verification of other more robust methods. So here are our three estimates. We might justify using the midpoint of 14%, or if we felt strongly about the quality of one estimate over another, we could elect to use it. The cost of issuing new common stock is greater than the cost of retained earnings. Issuing securities involves flotation cost, the cost of underwriting, legal fees, etc. When an established firm with common stock outstanding issues new equity, it's a negative signal to the market. The intuition is that it's the firm's last resort. There's a pecking order theory. A firm uses retained earnings first. 
If funds are still needed, they go to debt. Less costly, no ownership dilution. Last resort, new equity. Stock prices move on news, and the announcement of a stock issue is news, not the actual issue. So when the issue is announced, the stock price may fall on the news, requiring the firm to issue more shares to raise enough funds. Adjusting for flotation cost uses the DCF model. Continuing our Coleman example with the addition of a 15% flotation cost. Flotation cost is incorporated into the denominator of the constant growth model, reducing the price received by the issuer. The cost of new equity rises to 15.4%. Flotation costs for common equity are the highest since the asset is the riskiest. Flotation costs for preferred and debt are frequently ignored since they're significantly smaller. Ignoring flotation costs and using the cost of retained earnings as the cost of equity, we substitute into the weighted average cost of capital equation and find a cost of capital of 11.6%. How can a firm affect its cost of capital? A firm cannot control market conditions such as interest rates or tax rates. If interest rates rise, the cost of all the components go up. If tax rates rise, the cost of capital decreases. A firm can control its capital structure. How much of the firm is funded with debt versus equity? More debt, less equity brings the cost of capital down. A firm's dividend policy can affect its cost of capital, since paying out less means more retained earnings and less need to go outside for funding. A firm's investment policy affects the risk perceived by investors and their required return. You hear firms talk about their hurdle rate, the return that all projects must meet or beat to be accepted. But should the composite cost of capital be a hurdle rate? No. A firm's overall cost of capital reflects the required return on a project with the average risk of all the firm's projects. Different projects, different divisions have different risk. The cost of capital needs to be adjusted. This demonstrates the fallacy of using a flat hurdle rate. If the company didn't risk adjust, it would mistakenly accept project H and reject project L. If the company uses a correctly risk-adjusted cost of capital, it would accept L and reject H. This ends our coverage of Chapter 10, The Weighted Average Cost of Capital.